Hello, and welcome to another Clearly Aligned podcast. My name is Dr. Stephen Schalk, and I'm excited to be with you today talking about the Carrier Motion Appliance with my very close friend, Kelly Terrell. Now, what we're going to be chatting about is a very popular topic and was highly requested by our listeners. And both Kelly and I have used this appliance fairly extensively in our practices, and so it's a very fun topic. So we'll jump to that interview in just a moment, just giving some announcements of updates for those who are interested. Uh, I just finished speaking in Toronto. Uh, I was also in Burlington and Ottawa. And now here we are, right now it's uh, beginning of October. I'm gonna be speaking in Saskatoon, Winnipeg, and in Edmonton, coming up on the 14th, 15th, and the 16th of October. And we're then moving into our plans for 2023. So I am working on some content for future courses right now. And along with that, I also am working towards uh, three live events in Canada in the year 2023. We're going to be speaking in Vancouver in January, talking about our foundational systems of clear liner treatment course. Then we'll be in Calgary in May and Toronto in September or October. We're still working out the details. Calgary is going to be talking about attachments and biomechanics, planning out your digital treatment plans and designs and clin checks. And then in uh, Toronto, we're going to be talking about mixed dentition is what the course will be on. Um, and so that's a huge passion of mine. I love talking about mixed dentition and clear aligners. And so uh, if it's something you're interested in, the early bird discount pricing is available on clearlyaligned.ca and uh, there is a discount available for those who've previously taken online courses. Um, if you contact us, you get the course uh, live and in person for $1,200. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump on into our podcast interview. Welcome back, everyone, to the Clearly Aligned podcast. I have the founder, um, Dr. Stephen Schulk, with me, and I am Kelly Tyrrell. I'm an ortho hygienist and digital treatment planner. And today we are going to talk about the Carrier Distalizer and why we think that you should add it to your toolbox and how we use it and all the details that go along with it. So cool. hello, Thanks, Dr. Kelly. Schulk. Thanks for uh, being on with me again. Always a pleasure. And uh, I always just say whenever this happens, but this is actually our second recording because mm -hmm. we did this entire podcast and then realized that I had screwed up the audio. So it's a day later and here we are again. <laughs> so <laughs> second time's better. Exactly. So hopefully we have even more pearls to bring everybody. Exactly. Exactly. So I know um, the carry distalizer is both uh, as part of both you and I's um, toolbox for sure. We use it consistently. Um, we've used it for years. Um, and so obviously, so maybe you can mention like who, who created it and we're kind of why, why are we even using it? Why are we sure. complicating things? Sure. Cool. So a carry motion um, or carry distalizer is essentially mm -hmm. a uh, appliance that is made to help correct class two bites. Uh, Luis Carrier out of uh, Spain, he's the one who originally invented the appliance. What it is essentially is a bar that glues on to the upper first molar and the upper first premolar or from the upper first molar to the upper canine. And so that bar glues onto the teeth and allows you to hook an elastic rubber band from the anterior tooth, so from the canine or the premolar, down to the lower first molar, which may have a hook on it um, to hook the elastic onto, or the lower second molar, depending on how you set it up. What it's doing is it's allowing you to create more force with your elastics. You can use a heavier elastic, essentially. Whereas with traditional Invisalign trays, if you're hooking directly onto the tray itself, then it's gonna pull the tray off, or it's going to sometimes be too flimsy where that precision hook is. Or if you're using a button, it can actually snap some of the white buttons if you're using too heavy of a size, or it can debond your button. So this is just allowing us to create more force in terms of the class two correction. Now, if this is a non-growing patient, right, we don't expect we're gonna get class two correction from the, the growth. And so we need to actually change the bite by backing up the teeth and I'm going to talk about this later, but the bite actually changes through other methods like the teeth extruding 
as well as some of the back molars kind of having some distal crown tip. So the crowns mm -hmm. are tipping distally. If the patient's growing, then we know that there's going to be growth modification as we slow down the amount of growth that the maxilla experiences. So those are kind of the two ways that it's used, either in a growing or non-growing patient, essentially just a bar that glues to the teeth that allows you to hook up heavier elastics. And um, I'll just say one Absolutely. caveat at the beginning here <laughs> before I let Kelly jump back in. Um, I didn't mention until almost the very end of the last one, so I thought I'd say it this time yeah. that uh, <laughs> this, this podcast is completely 100% unsponsored. We both use this product because we like it. And we're talking about it today because this was the most requested topic that people wanted us to speak on. Um, but we get no financial um, uh, incentives. We don't get anything for free. Uh, we're not paid to speak on this topic. Absolutely. Um, yeah, we, we both love it. And I think um, I think we love it for a couple of reasons. It, it makes um, our work more efficient in the practice. So, so chair time, but definitely that efficiency um, and time savings usually almost always passes along to our patients. And, and that's why it was created. And, and that's why we've we've adopted it. And it, it's not an it's not a new thing. It's not new to us. Um, but I know, you know, in traditional aligner, um, you know, when you're taking, you know, aligner 101 courses um you know you're sticking just to aligners you're even afraid to start using elastics and anything silver is a little scary or in in uh, dr shulk uses clear carriers um i haven't i haven't done that yet so maybe that's on my to do to do list next um but you know we we have a lot of experience um in this area and uh you know we just find it adds a lot um, to our practice and again, saving time, saving energy and getting, um, that initial AP, that forward backward relationship done earlier, um, it is a huge advantage, which is why we're talking about it today and kind of explaining why we bring it up and why we, um, refer to it a lot. Like you refer to it a lot in your courses, um, which is fantastic. Um, what I love and one of the, I mean, it's totally um, burned into my brain because I, I, I really did love it is your higher, high, hierarchy of case types. So the case complexities, it's like a rainbow of like starting off in the shallow end of the pond up to like very complex cases, which you can do with, you know, all aligners. Um, but what I do love about uh, the Carrier system is that it's taking those very complex cases, class two, class three, you know, big overjets, overbites, and bringing them kind of up to at least the middle range of the pool, if not a bit higher, and turning them just basically into your class one crowding, class one spacing, where you can knock it out of the park with, you know, clearly aligned course help um, to help you do that properly. And so that's our goal here is to help you use this tool to bring you from a scary case type into a, an easier case type. And then, you know, just you, you, you've got it from there. Totally. And I think that's just it is sometimes people, people will say, well, you're not doing this just with aligners. And sometimes if there's a really hard to spin premolar on a lower arch, we'll go ahead and actually bond some buttons to that tooth and use some C chain, orthodontic C chain, which is used to close up spaces with brackets and wires. But we can go ahead and spin a really complicated, uh, challenging to move tooth to put that tooth into the proper position. And so I like to say that what we care most about is the orthodontic results. It doesn't matter that we have to do everything with just clear aligners. We can use other tools and techniques because what matters most at our practice is efficiency. Um, once I, I should say first, what matters is of course, clinical results, but once clinical results are achieved, then it's about how do we do it as efficiently as possible to maximize our profitability. And so exactly. that's where exactly turning these more challenging cases into easier cases makes us more profitable because it's smoother sailing. Right. And, and we've both done it um, that way. We've both done it with aligners only. We're the <laughs> yeah. champion and we're giving ourselves a medal. But when you become wiser and smarter, you start to realize, why did I do that when now I've discovered there's other tools or like, why am I so against having some helpers, some, some extra little tools or things I'm bonding on or adding on or elastics or there's lots of things that we use. And as you as you do more complex cases, if you're just doing simple cases, of course you can bang those out with just aligners, but 
if you want to do do it all or do the majority of cases, um, you, you know, you're going to need some help. You're going to realize that quickly. And we're trying to help you fast track and um, not experience all the pain points that we had totally. to go through. A hundred percent. That's true. So what case types would you, um, when you're in your new patient exam and you are, you know, um, whether it's, uh, let's, let's just aim like for the older kind of teen adult. So like maybe non-growing, let's say, who would you say, you know what, I'm going to choose a carrier for you versus let's just go straight to sequential distalization. Sure. So I guess let's talk first about the mechanics of how the carrier works. Mm -hmm. And then we'll talk about kind of case selection. I mentioned it before, but what happens with the carrier in non-growing adult patients is it's actually changing the occlusal plane. So the way that the teeth are biting together, um, it's doing that by doing three things. Essentially, there is some pure distalization that does occur, but the crowns of the molars, they are also going to tip distally, and there's going to be a small amount of intrusion on those as the carrier um, kind of pushes back distally against those teeth. On the tooth, the anterior tooth where the appliance um, connects to either the canine or the first premolar, there's going to be some extrusion happening. And so what that's doing then is if you kind of think of a teeter totter, the posterior teeth are intruding a little bit and the anterior teeth are extruding exactly. And so <laughs> what that's doing is it is changing the occlusal plane. And so some of the class two correction is happening, not just from uh, distalization. The second part is that there is again, that true distalization. And so with sequential distalization using aligners, we're backing up the teeth one at a time. So we move back the second molar, then the first molar, second premolar, first premolar, et cetera, et cetera. The carrier is helping us kind of distalize and back up those teeth all at the exact same time. It's kind of moving that whole bulk segment. And so sequential distalization is very challenging to do if you have to do more than four millimeters of it. So if you're using essentially Invisalign's ClinCheck software and you look at the grid tool, you can actually count how many millimeters do you need to sequentially move that those molars back. If you then look and see that it's six millimeters or four millimeters or eight millimeters, really anything above four, it's beneficial to maybe consider using a carrier because that's such a difficult thing to back up all those teeth using light elastics. Mm -hmm. The second part of it then, which is what I was just talking about with the extrusion that happens and the change of the occlusal plane is you need to look at your patient's face because there's three different face types. Patients can either be short faced so those are brachyfacial patients, or another term is hypodivergent. It's more of a European term. So that's just referring to really short facial types. Then they can be um, mesofacial, and that can be normal facial types, um, or they're gonna be dolicofacial or hyperdivergent, which are really long face types. And so if someone's starting off with a really long face and you're extruding those anterior teeth, it's going to change the occlusal plane in a negative way. It makes their face longer. If you're using a carrier and extruding those teeth in somebody who is hypodivergent or brachyfacial, short lower facial third, it's going to make the face a little bit longer and that's going to be more beneficial. Now, how much can we actually change patients' facial types? We're talking about a couple millimeters here. So it's nothing significant, but it's just there's certain patients that you may look at saying that's a really long face they have a really steep occlusal plane already, this isn't the best patient to allow extrusion of the teeth to occur. And so this is a patient where it's better to try and treat through sequential distalization of the teeth. Um, and so it's just kind of balancing that aspect in a non-growing patient. So okay. kind of a complicated answer, but what I'll normally be looking for then is someone who needs to distalize teeth more than four millimeters, who has a short or normal facial balance, um, and I'm going to avoid cases where we need to distalize a significant amount on a really long face typed patient. Okay. Awesome. That's good for, yeah, I don't always can consider that type of thing. I'm more, you know, I'm not the orthodontist. I'm not the <laughs> doctor. I'm just more like moving the teeth, moving the teeth, but it's good to have those parameters. And again, we're trying to think of the whole patient and, and the whole situation and especially 
um, to be cautious in your growing patients that you at least need to be aware that you need to assess for all of these different things before you just jump on and start distalizing things without considering their growth, because now, you know, you could really complicate things for yourself and, you know, have to backtrack. So. And where it probably applies the most actually, Kelly, which is interesting is probably more the smile arc. So if yeah. you're going to be extruding those anterior teeth in a long face patient, they're often gummy smiled patients already. Yeah. And so if you're looking being like, wow, this is super gummy smiled patient, then that's kind of the, the one where you don't really want to do it because those canines are going to extrude. Exactly. And so for those of you who are kind of new, obviously if you're extruding teeth, the gums come with them. Yes, <laughs> so they do. <laughs> more gummy, which, yes. you know, sometimes we don't realize what we know and what we don't know. These things come slowly over time. Totally. Okay. So that's, that's awesome. Um, question. I mean, since you're distalizing, um, whether what, what age, age, um, not non-age specific, but let's just say it's an adult, if they still have their wisdom teeth, does that matter to you? Do you make them take them out right away or do you have a conversation or do you just go for it? Sure. It kind of depends. I think that's the great thing with orthodontics and doing treatment is that you can probably do it lots of different ways and it will often still work. Mm -hmm. But if the patient's uh, second or uh, wisdom teeth, I should say, if those are present and they're fully erupted, there's likely not going to be enough space to actually distalize the second molars because they've run out of space um, posterior to those second molars. And so you, in that case, I would say are likely going to be looking to have those teeth extracted. If the okay. second, uh, if the wisdom teeth are unerupted, what will often happen is as you distalize the teeth, there's going to be space because again, the crowns are actually um, not truly translating and mm -hmm. the roots moving as much as the crowns are distalizing, the roots are staying in the same spot. And so that's more of a distal crown tip. Now, awesome. if that's a growing patient and there's not a lot of space for the wisdom teeth to come in already, it will likely mean that the wisdom teeth are going to be impacted and they're not going to mm -hmm. come in. Now that kind of raises the choice of, do you take those teeth out first and then distalize the teeth? Or do you make that choice just to say, well, the patient's probably not going to go ahead with this case if we're telling them we need to take those wisdom teeth out right now. They're only 15 or 16 or whatever. So the wisdom teeth can kind of be assessed and dealt with at a later period of time. So mm -hmm. to me, it kind of depends. If it's going to be a deal breaker to take the wisdom teeth out, then I'm going to go ahead and treat in those impacted situations without taking them out. Or if yeah. the wisdom teeth just are not ready to come out. They're too young. But too if... Young. If it's yeah, something that, where yeah. I, yeah, if I know they're going to come out, I'd rather take them out because once you remove the wisdom teeth, you're going to have a lot of inflammation distal to the sevens or the second molars. And that's going to allow you to distalize those teeth much quicker. And it's actually going to be way more beneficial. So yeah. we'll usually try to start two weeks after maybe two to three weeks after the wisdom teeth have come out. Then we'd go ahead and start the orthodontics. So okay. it, it, it's kind of case dependent there. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. Um, we do the exact same thing. It's fantastic. I mean, if they have full coverage, they were going to get them anyways out like, you know, in the summer, like a, a month, a, a month, a month from now, like go with it, like get it all done. It, what's the difference? What order you put it in? Um, but if it, if it's a deal breaker, I mean, a lot of orthodontists, um, apart from class three, where your wisdom teeth are there yes. and we have no, yes. nowhere to back it up. We need some room. Um, but the majority of, uh, orthodontists, I would, I would say, I would, at least from the ones I've worked with, um, we, we don't, um, say, well, if you don't get those out or we can't start until you get those out, we, we get started. And, um, again, if we think that may be an obstacle, why things are going slow, We'll, we'll broach that topic, but very rarely, usually it's an afterthought. Um, things go very well. It doesn't bother us. Um, but for our younger patients, um, like teens, um, you know, we usually let them do it at their own time schedule. And you're right. It doesn't interfere with our distalization. It, it's just not really a factor in most people's cases for sure. Mm -hmm, totally. So, um, with, uh, the Carrier, what, materials do I need? So, so far, like I've got my, my clinic set up, I've got my Invisalign, you know, materials. It took me some time to think about that and get myself set up just for the Invisalign orthodontics, let's say, um, what do I need? Do I need anything special to, to bond these carriers? Sure. I guess the first thing that you're going to need is a carrier, <laughs> um, <laughs> in Canada, they're sold by serum, um, orthodontics 
And in the United States, I think they're sold by Henry Schein Orthodontics. But if you just go online and search Carrier Appliance, Carrier Motion Appliance is the proper term, then there's going to be information out there about where to get your distributor to send them to you. Two different kinds. One is plastic, one is metal. We'll talk about the differences later. Um, mm -hmm. But if you're using a metal one, you need less. So you essentially etch the teeth. Then you're going to apply your bond, air dry your bond. It's probably 50-50 for uh, doctors that cure after they air dry their bond versus going ahead and then just placing the appliance on with the cement. Um, mm -hmm. We normally will cure in between, mm -hmm. but I, I know sometimes if there's isolation issues, you can actually go ahead and just cure um, the cement and the bond at the exact same time. But yeah, then you're going to go ahead <laughs> and yeah. And I don't know, call it lazy. I was going to ask I don't what know. you do. <laughs> no, that's super common. <laughs> Orthodontists usually do not cure their bond before they um, put their brackets on the teeth or bond a button yeah. or anything. General dentist, we're so used to curing before we put a filling in. And so oh. the, the, the procedure is a little different, but if you want to be super sure that it's going to work as best as possible, we would cure before okay. placing the cement and the, the bar on the teeth or a button or a bracket or whatever. Um, that gives you better bond strength, but it doesn't really necessarily matter that much. It's more important to not have saliva contamination. Right. So yep, faster is sometimes better. So okay. then you'll go ahead. What's really important is making sure that on the actual appliance that you're going to be gluing to the teeth, that you want to kind of push down after you've put mm -hmm. the cement onto the pad and make sure it kind of squeezes right in between all the grooves. Yeah. And really, I should probably get Kelly to say all this because she's she's um, probably way more experienced at actually placing them than me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, so it's important to butter it in because the base of it is like a waffle. It's like it's like ripply, like a ripples potato chips. Um, so you really want to butter your your bond. So I use trans bond. I, I don't know all, a million different versions, but uh, the offices I've worked at trans bond. I, I think it's just yeah, your go to glue. I, I, th I think it's cheap, or at least I use it like it's cheap. Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> but we really kind of butter it in there. You don't want to just like, you know, put a slab on top. You want to make sure it gets into the groove so that you really have that nice um, interface with the product, the carrier, the glue, and then your tooth. And then we just, you know, very, and, you know, we just do to, tap it just into Just to clarify, what Kelly's talking about there is, the, is getting the glue or the cement um, yes. into the grooves. So the bond, yes. you still just bond the tooth. Yes. But then so the yeah, like gel the etch, do that. I use Assure. Assure is my liquid gold, but For whatever bond, bond yeah. you love, that's fine. Um, so yeah. we do that. Then it's your cement that you're buttering into the back of like the carrier, the, the working side of it. And then you're going to place it and we place it horizontal to the occlusal plane. Those of us who've been doing it for time, we know it's going to extrude those in um, the canine or the premolar slightly. We're used to the vampire look. So sometimes we counteract that by bonding it slightly more in size also it doesn't have as much of a pull um but you know if, if you're just going on the carrier website it's going to say bond um you know parallel to mid, the occlusal plane yeah. that's okay vampire teeth that means it's working it's all good yeah. don't worry about it we correct that later with the aligners um and then you're just going to give it a nice a seating like you're going to push it don't extrude all the glue but make sure it's well adapted to the tooth just you know kind of like that it's, it's well adapted and then you're going to cure it. And it, it's as easy as that. The um, the distal portion on the molar, um, it's fitting right in that mesial buckle groove. And the carrier itself has a little dot on it. So, I mean, you cannot go wrong. D is the dot in the groove? Bond it. Done. Um, and then in a perfectly sized carrier, the uh, canine portion or the premolar portion is just hugging the the apex or the curve of the tooth. So it's kind of coming around the mesial a little bit, hugging it perfectly. Uh, you can adjust that a little bit because, you know, we're not all perfectly sized human beings. So you can take a little plier and just adapt it a little bit to curve around a little bit more, a little bit less so that it's well adapted for, you know, individual patients. Um, but they really fit really, really well. And um, that being said, you are sizing them. So what we do is we um, either pre-measure at the new patient exam. Uh, it's a simple little ruler. And we just make a note in the chart, like 25 millimeters on the right, 27 millimeters on the left. And we, uh, Dr. Shulk and I have a 
big closet full of um, all different <laughs> kinds because we use them so consistently. But if you don't, you're going to have uh, you're going to order at least the most common types. Your rep can help you out with those numbers. But, um, you know, from canine to molar, it, it usually is 25, 27, 29 would be long. Um, and then like 15, 17, 19 would be your shorties, like where you're bonding premolar to um, uh, premolar to first molar. So it's like a short set. Um, and Oh, you're cutting like, out Oh, there, I Kelly. have a carrier case. Sorry. Can you say that again? You just, you just cut out on our feet. Oh, did I just cut the, out? The so yeah, some, some of us will bond, um, some of us will order our carriers on the fly. We mm -hmm. will, um, you know, we'll have that because we don't do a lot of them. Yeah, let's one say. at a time. Yeah. And so you'll call up your rep and say, hey, could you send me, you know, two 15s or two 17s or whatever, you know, whatever you need. Um, and as you start to use them more frequently, you might start to have some inventory of the favorites, um, you know, and the favorites for us, short sets would be 15 millimeter, 17 millimeter, maybe 18 or 19 millimeter. And then mm. canine to molar tends to be 25, 27, 29 would be a big mouse, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> yes. <definitely. laughs> Muppet, Muppet style. But, um, but those are like common numbers that we're used to. And, um, you know, we don't, I don't tend to order like half sizes, like kind of like shoes, you don't order half yeah. sizes, because that wastes your time. Um, for those patients who are in between, and sometimes you have a different size, one, one side of the mouth to the other, um, you just adapt it. That's where you just bend it around. And you're like, yeah, I get it. This one's a little longer than the span I have measured for. Um, but you still bond it and it still works amazingly well. And so. Um, what tools do you like using in your practice for adapting the metal ones? So I will typically either use my Weingart, which is my go-to ortho plier. It's just got, again, just like we talked about the back of the Carrier base, it's, it's waffled. So it has a good gripping surface and I basically am tweaking it. Um, I mean, a cotton plier would be too fragile. I don't think I could bend it with a cotton plier. Yeah. Um, but you know, you could use a bird beak, which is basically just two simple streamlined prongs that I can bend it with or um, a three nose. I mean, you know, you, yeah. it's, it's fragile. You don't have to put too much pressure at all. It's not like you're really, Urgh. yeah, it's definitely very, yeah, very yeah. fragile. So um, you're not, not going to break it. Um, if you bend it too far one way, you can certainly bend it back without an issue. Yeah. That's um, what we find as well. Yeah. And there, there are, I mean, they do have special like placement pliers that hold on to it. Like it's like a, it's like a plier yeah. that has like a notch cut out to it. So you can very precisely put it on the teeth. I don't do that. <laughs> I think sometimes I even do it with my fingers. I'm not even sure, to be honest, yeah. I just get it done. Yeah. Um, once it's on the teeth, you have time. The, the, the cement isn't going to yeah, set no. immediately. No. Yeah, just it put it on there. A light cured cement normally. Because um, yeah. I guess we skipped that last um, part of it is in terms of the materials, then uh, Transbond is the go-to for mm -hmm. the cement. Uh, I think Kelly and I both use Transbond the most. It's a light cured. So once you get it yes. adapted, then you go ahead and you just hit it with your light. Normally what we would do is just tack cure for like three seconds on okay. the molar pad and on the canine or the first premolar. And then we'd come back once now we've got it on, then we'd give it a full cure. Um, okay. I, um, We'll add just one thing on the plastic ones is that, yeah, you can even adapt them or bend them a little bit just using your fingers. You don't even need to have a three prong plier or a wine guard or anything like that. You can just go ahead and hold it between your index finger and thumb and kind of just bend it with your other index finger and thumb. And um, same thing. You, you just kind of adjust it as needed for it to adapt nicely to that kind of mesial marginal um what we say line angle of the tooth. So it's kind of yeah. two thirds towards the mesial and the canine and in the mid buckle groove, like Kelly said in on the molar and it can again, either go on the canine or you can go ahead and have a shorty, which is on the first premolar. And that's kind of what Kelly was mentioning with the sizes is that obviously it's going to be a smaller size going from the first molar to the canine or the first molar to the first premolar. And so Kelly, in your practice you guys would mostly go from first molar to canine right yeah for for almost everyone we do 
canine to first molar. Um, and uh, we've only done metal, I think, because our rep, in, like way back when we started, whenever that first year was that Carrier's came out, we totally jumped on board and they've been fantastic, been using them for some serious time. But early on, um, our, our rep had told us that they were having some trouble with the clear ones debonding and we don't want to waste time. So we just never, I've never bonded a clear one. Um, but I know you have told me um, that you're having amazing success. And that was just like the gen one. Like they were working at the kinks and it's come a long way. And um, our rep just has not informed us that <laughs> things have gotten better. So our patients yeah. are still blinged out with silver. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, at our office, we are very aesthetically focused. And so if you've heard me speak before, I talk a lot about lingual Invisalign, where we actually place all of the attachments um, for the upper anterior teeth on the lingual of the canines and incisors. So nobody has any buckle attachments. And I teach about that through... Um, the attachments and biomechanics course at Clearly Aligned. But because of that, we're trying to keep the cases as aesthetic as possible. And so we generally don't go from the canines distal. We go from the first premolars distal. Mm -hmm. And so we use the white clear, I guess clear, um, carrier. What's different with that is that the clear does not bond nearly as well. We used to have debonds all the time when we first started with the original generation of Carrier. Now it's gone a lot better. And there's also some techniques that help. So if you're using a clear one, what I would recommend that you do is before you place the cement into the kind of waffle or I guess the like ruffled area of the internal aspect of the appliance, if you use a mono bond or a plastic conditioner, and the plastic conditioner is sold by the same companies that sell the Carrier, that mm -hmm. plastic conditioner helps the bond strength of the plastic to the cement. And so you just go ahead and take a micro brush, you put it on, it's gonna evaporate within about 10 seconds, and it's it smells quite chemically, but that's what's gonna actually increase the bond strength from the plastic to the cement itself. And so that definitely has made a difference for us, so we were pretty consistent about using that plastic conditioner, or if you're doing like a lot of um, bonding with crowns, then you might have mono bond in your office already. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. That's, that's great information. I didn't know that. So I'm happy. I'm happy to have learned yeah. that for sure. <laughs> Um, I would say, um, I don't know about you, but it, it's very rare that our carriers become debonded. I mean, they are on there. Um, and you know, we use that cement and that same assure for our brackets, um, maybe not the cement, I mean, for our Kaplan hooks, for all of our elastics and, and those Assure, things, we, Assure yeah. just for jumping in is the type of bond. Yes. Like yes. That's my like liquid, liquid, liquid bond yeah. sold by Reliance. I don't know who sells that. I yeah. don't follow any of that stuff, but, um, in my head, if it doesn't have gold on it. <laughs> <laughs> and I agree. Use, Assure, need, yeah. Assure is great. The other one that we use quite a bit is uh, ortho solo. So Assure ortho and solo. ortho solo. Okay are kind of the okay. two, I would say, best ortho bonds. Yes. Sometimes um, if I'm really, really worried um, or it's a very wet situation um, or it's become debonded before, um, not necessarily the Carrier, but anything, a Kaplan hook or whatnot, um, I will do my gel etch. I'm like really specific about counting that I am not rushing that because I'm a fast person. I like chair time to be efficient, <laughs> um, but I don't, don't want to rush my etch. Um, and then, uh, we also paint L pop, which is, um, like a all in one, it's got your etch and bond together. And the reason for that is that it actually etches a different part of the enamel. I can't even remember to be honest, but you know, um, the, the gel etch, the blue etch etches one part. And then the L pop slightly roughens up different parts of the anatomy. And so you've got this like super Velcro like surface that then my Assure, my liquid bond goes over. And I feel like I've done double duty. I don't mm -hmm. take that step with everyone. A lot of my team does. Um, so, but I so you'll do the most... L pop and then you'll still do the Assure. Yes. Okay. I know. Do you, do you cure it or do you just um, put one li liquid layer and then another liquid layer? Yep. Just a liquid layer. And with the L pop, you actually kind of massage it in yours, which is weird because you know, with etch, you're not supposed to like touch the surface or whatever, but with the L pop, you actually are supposed to like, just somehow Scrub rub it, it in with yeah. your micro micro brush. Um, and, and so a lot of orthos will do that. They'll do this two-step bond where it's the gel etch, then the L pop, 
um, consistently for our brackets, mm -hmm. for everything. Um, again, I don't know, again, sometimes I just think I'm lazy or I don't believe in it. Um, but it, it actually does etch a different part, a different, whatever, whether it's a protein, it's, it's activating different crystals. I don't know if it's the, mm -hmm. whatever, I have no idea. I can't remember. Um, oh, but a, lo <laughs> a lot of orthodontists use that process. Um, and it's just a superior bond. So if someone's debonded and things are coming off, uh, then I'm like, okay, now we're going to level up. Yeah. We're just going to do that extra step. And uh, it, it seems to work. And I just heard it at the CAO, um, a top orthodontist was talking about her process and she did it and she did explain exactly what it was etching. And I was like, mm, okay, apparently I didn't latch on to what it's etching, but <laughs> yeah. That's interesting because I, I haven't thought about LPOP for years, but back when I was doing mm -hmm. some brackets and wires, we would use LPOP whenever you had a stubborn bracket that kept coming off. So yeah. it makes perfect sense that you would use it in this context too. Mm -hmm. But I, I will say Carrier's, I think just because it's got such a ni nice wide base, both in the molar and the canine, it really is on there. If anything, it's on there mm -hmm. so well that when we come to debond it, um, that's probably one of my most, um, not to scare anyone off, but it's on there. So when I have to remove it, it's like, I feel like I'm cracking a walnut with a nutcracker. <laughs> I, I'm nervous. So what I do is I take my yeah, high speed. Yeah, let's talk on, uh, on how to take them off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm a Canadian hygienist, so we can use drills. Um, so I use a composite, um, flame and I get underneath the, the pad, um, because you do have access and you can get under there. So I undermine it. I take off all that extra glue on the canine and the molar so that I know I've created some tunnels there. And then I basically take a ligature cutter, which is, um, it almost looks like a scissor really, but it's got a nice fine edge to it. And I just make sure it's right at the interface of the, um, you know, the buckle wall and the carrier. And I, I just give it a clamp and honestly, like I have to squeeze it. And so I'm always like, I'm going to crack my knuckle. Um, but you know, it's on there. Like the bond is a really amazing, um, mm -hmm. you know, and which is why it's stronger, which is why it's distalizing, which is why it can support heavy, heavy elastics. Um, it's a really, really good device. Um, so it's easy to remove. Um, but I would take that extra step of making it easier for yourself by taking off any excess pad of glue under there. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, cause I know you mentioned this last time when we were recording, um, Kelly and I both do the same thing too, which is to have the patient, you might've mentioned this and I missed it, yes. but have them bite down on a cotton roll. So yes. you get the patient to bite down nice and firmly because sometimes these teeth are a little wiggly. So mm -hmm. if you're going ahead and having them open and then you're using that pin and ligature cutter on their appliance and you're kind of breaking the glue seal, sometimes it's, it's just a little bit uncomfortable if that canine tooth or premolar tooth has mobility to it and it's wiggling around. So you get them to bite down on that cotton roll that stabilizes everything. And then Excellent. you'll just hear, like Kelly said, it, it is a little bit um, loud. Like I was warning them like, there's going to be pretty loud. It's not your tooth breaking. It's yeah. just the, the seal breaking of the glue. Yeah. And yeah, you're right. Like, so that, so, um, to be clear, like that cotton roll is placed right. If it was canine to canine, you're literally having the canines bite on that cotton roll. It's holding them steady while you do your work. It, it's, it, it's less than half a second and it's over with. It's not mm -hmm. a big deal. No, no child cries, no adult <laughs> cries. It's all good. Um, but it just, it's, so, it makes it so much easier for you as the clinician and for the patient, just that the teeth are steady. Um, the molar usually comes off really easy. So I usually remove the canine first and then the molar, it's really just a tweak of my plier. It's just like a, it's just like a, you know, a torque of the plier of and yeah. that's off. That's not a big deal at all for sure. Yeah. Cause it's a stronger tooth, right? It's supporting itself. It's got three roots or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's less of an issue, but yeah, the canine, if it's a bit mobile, um, you know, you just want to secure that a little bit yeah. for sure. So let's talk. So we've got it on, yeah. we've got it off. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we although, know why we're putting it let's on. Let's jump in one quick thing. Taking off yeah. a plastic one is a little bit different. Oh yeah. Yeah. So why don't I say that? And then we'll jump back. So when you're okay. taking off a plastic one, what you do differently is you can cut through the actual plastic with your flame burr, your gold flame. Mm. And so I will just go ahead and cut right through the plastic on the neck of the appliance kind of between. So I'm usually going from the premolar. So I'm going kind of like on the distal side of the premolar. I just cut right through the appliance and it's very quick and easy. It's like cutting through butter. Then okay. I grab the bar and I just twist it and pop it out of like the ball socket from the uh, first molar. Then 
I just take my burr and I just smooth down all the extra composite right down to the tooth. And then okay. the same thing like Kelly said on the six or the first molar, I just go ahead and kind of remove all of the composite uh, cement from, I should say, from around the edges of the tooth. And then I get the pin and leg cutter and it just slides right in, bite down on a piece of gauze, and then it just squeeze and it just pops off. Um, okay. So very, very similar, but it's actually a little bit easier because you don't have that quite as loud of the nutcracker sound on the, the canine or the premolar. That's really, really easy to get it off of those teeth. But it's okay. just um, the, the six is the harder spot because you've just got that one pad on that back tooth. Okay, awesome. Um, and we did talk, I mean, our first uh, session was the podcast about elastics, which again, with, with, without elastics, the carrier is just a decoration. Totally. <laughs> it doesn't do anything just because you bonded it. It's not moving at all. Um, so definitely refer to that podcast if you haven't watched it yet. Um, but I will say like specific to the carrier itself, um, carrier has its own elastics that you can order, which we both fully support. They're, they're strong. They're amazing. They, they say that they're the same ounce, but they have that little extra, you know, boost of steroids or something in them, um, that make them more powerful. And we tend to do six to eight ounce yes. force yes. one or force two is what they're called force yes. one and force two. Um, so some of us will start off with the four, I think most of us start off with the force one, we kind of ease them into it, whether it's a week or two or that whole first session. And then we have the force two in our, our back pocket, but don't be afraid to use them. They're just stronger elastics. And the, the, the idea here is to be efficient, to, to get those moved back. Mm -hmm. Yes. So what Kelly was saying is that again, the elastics podcast covers a lot of it, but normally the weight of the elastic, whether it's six ounce or eight ounce refers to how much weight would have to be placed on the elastic to get it to stretch three times its starting diameter. Now, the James McNamara, um, he did a study to see how much force was required with those force ones and force twos and found that they actually require more than the six ounces or the eight ounces compared to a different brand. And so unless the patient has a latex allergy because the Carrier appliances mm -hmm are not, um, they are not, uh, latex free, then I would use the, the force one and the force two. Mm -hmm. For latex free, speaking of, I don't think we talked too much about that in our elastic podcast. So latex free elastics are a bit of a pain. They break, they break often. a lot more. I mean, totally. we don't have a great solution for that. It, you know, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. Um, if you had a new patient who was in your chair and you knew that they had a latex allergy, would that deter you from using a Carrier? Good question. It, it hasn't thus far. Okay. I think that if it's something that I knew, um, I would probably just have a conversation with them about treatment time, that it could be longer or that we might not right. achieve the same results or that the patient just has to be better. There's a lot yeah. less room for non-compliance. So right. if their elastics are breaking, they've got to go ahead and get them a new set back in again. Um, okay. And that it might be more annoying because of the breakage, but it's something that they're going to have to do if they want to be successful. Right. So yeah, don't get frustrated and like just, yeah, if you pre pre warn them that mm -hmm. latex elastics, they tend to just pop more often, whether you yawn or you're just talking, it's just a different experience. Mm -hmm. um, so they're just going to have to pop them on and off more often. There's really nothing we can do about it. It's not brand specific. It just is, it is what it is. Yeah. It is frustrating. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, awesome. So we've got these carriers on, we've got them hooked up with the right elastics. And again, um, you know, refer to that elastic podcast, but you are changing your elastics frequently, um, like super frequently wearing them 24 seven to get this job done. Because again, with the carrier, it's all about elastics. The, the, that's the whole entire reason that you put them on there. Um, so how often would you check this patient to see how much they're distalizing like what are you looking for when you see them and what are the signs that they're cooperating or that it's working sure so what we should start to see is distal to the uh i should say mesial to whichever tooth the appliance is attached to so if that's on the canine at about a month you should start to see a very small space opening up or if nothing else if you take your floss and you floss between the contacts it should be a loose contact and you shouldn't have the snap of the floss. Right. So we like bringing back all of our patients for the carrier at one month because okay. we should either see that visible space or feel the open contact. 
if they don't have an open contact, then we would bring them back in a month again. And I would be telling them that this is not normal. So either their anatomy is really, really challenging and their bone is extremely dense, or they're not wearing their elastics enough slash changing them enough. Like Kelly said, we tell them they should change their elastics five to seven times a day. So that means mm -hmm. when you wake up in the morning, there's number one. When you have breakfast, at lunch, if you have a snack after school or after work, whatever, uh, at dinner, and then before you go to bed. So that's yeah. six times right there. And so every time you take your trays out to clean your teeth or when you wake up in the morning or before bed, change your elastics. And so what I like to do then is if I have a patient who I know this should be working, there should be a space present. Say it's a 16-year-old girl. Mm -hmm. I'll actually sometimes pull up the pictures of a 40-year-old man who has super dense bone. And after a month, there's visible space. And so I'll just ask her and say, either you have um, more dense bone than he does as mm -hmm. a 16-year-old girl, or you're not wearing your elastics enough um, or changing them out enough. Which one do you think it is? Right. And so that's what I love about the Carrier is that there's, it's a lie detector test. Mm -hmm. The teeth don't lie. And so you can just check and see, are they moving or not? And as Kelly's kind of mentioned, they should start to get a little bit more mobile. So mm -hmm. mobility on the canine or first premolar is normal. Um, and so if they don't have any of that going on and it's rock solid, you know, they're just not wearing it. Exactly. This is not going to work um, on, it doesn't matter if they're, they're teenage girls or boys, or if they're like my age woman, which tends to be sometimes the worst. Cause we're like, <laughs> Oh, I'm out with my girlfriends having a glass of wine, whatever. There's all these different, you know, co-op patients, but it's not going to work part-time. You, you can't wear them. You can't not wear them to school and wear them just at nighttime. This is not that type of appliance you need to commit. And the whole reason is to be efficient. So if you get them motivated at the very first, you know, new patient exam saying, Hey, I can give you this special appliance to start off with, and we can shave time off your treatment. Are you good to go? And, you know, get the, get them, get them to be part of the team. Um, usually, usually they'll get on board and, you know, in that, that first visit you're, when you're bonding it, you tell them. Hey, next visit, you're again, you're checking them in four weeks, which is really good motivation. Keeping on like I'm watching you, right? That's what you're saying. Um, and so basically you're saying, by the time you come back, I need to see a gap. So you need to see a space or be, be, have an open flossing contact at the least. You need to have a wiggle. So I'm going to wiggle this bar. If this tooth isn't moving, I know you're cheating. And I want you to start looking like a vampire and we're going to fix that later. But those are signs of success. And the sooner you get, you know, more towards that direction, big gap, more wiggle, more vampire, the sooner these bars come off, they're like, okay, game on, like, you know, get, get them ramped up, but there's no way they're going to do that part time. They're just wasting your time and theirs. And it, again, we're not going to abort mission you know, right away, we're going to try to motivate them, encourage them, um, get them into action. Sometimes they don't fully understand what we mean by full-time co-op. <laughs> yes. um, so we just, you know, you revisit that at that four week session and then four weeks later, but if, typically, if yeah, like typically not an adult, not like a big adult, but like sometimes these um, teens who maybe have stopped growing. So now we're kind of, you know, uh, we're, we're dealing with the situation that we have the class two, um, you know, they can get it done in 16, 24, 28 weeks. It, it is possible. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's very motivating for them that they can get this big step done and they can help you. Yeah. Like there's things we can do um, as you know, a dentist or orthodontist, and there's things we can't do and we can't do elastics for you. Uh, no matter what I do, we can get you partway there, but we can't fix your over jet or your overbite without elastics. I, I need your help. And so it depends what kind of happy ending they want. Yeah. One thing that you can do kind of to test and see how much they're wearing their elastics. We give them like five to seven bags of elastics normally when they first come in, mm -hmm. but is to kind of check over time, like let's say then you gave them um, three months after their first month, they're doing a good job and they come back in three months. Well, if you have a hundred elastics per bag and you've given them three bags, that means you've given them 300 elastics. Well, if they're changing out their elastics five to seven times a day, let's say minimum of five. Well, that means that those, that bag of elastics should last them for 20 days. Yes. So if you're seeing them back in three months, 
and they ha had three bags, for example, that they said they left, and they haven't gone through those elastics. Well, they should be going through three bags of elastic should be technically, if they didn't lose a single elastic and not a single one yeah. broke, then they should be 60 days. Yeah. So kind of just doing some of the math with the elastics too is another way that I'll kind of call out patients without making it an argument is just, well, my math is that you should go through a bag of elastics every like 15 to 20 days. How is it that last time you said you had two bags of elastics left and that was a month mm -hmm. ago and you still have one bag left at home? Right. You aren't wearing them enough. Right. So. You you definitely have to set up your patients for success. Don't be cheap with the elastics. No. Give, give them the elastics, yeah, the, like the more they use them, the better. Yeah. Um, and you know, like, you know, it, you just don't want them calling or saying I ran out of elastics and you're taping them to your office door or <laughs> they come back and say, I ran out two weeks ago, all of that progress. They may have made amazing progress in the first two weeks, but you didn't give them enough elastics and the mom's not going to drive them back. She doesn't know the importance. She hasn't heard the whole spiel. Mm -hmm. And now they've like kind of drifted back. And that's like really disappointing because they have made some effort. Yeah, um, so, yeah, I think that's Load good. Yeah, exactly. And then to that point, I mean, there are very few patients, I would say, who you know, at the new patient exam, we, we think, no, you can't do aligners. I can tell, I telepathically can tell <laughs> you can't handle it, or you're not going to do the elastics, which again, with this specific device, if you're not doing the elastics, nothing is happening. The, the lower teeth are going to align because they're in an aligner. Um, but that's all that would be happening. So you're basically treating one arch and it's getting a, a jump start on the upper, but there are a few patients where it, 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 whatever the situation may be, if the parent or the patient is telling you, I'm not going to wear them, I am telling you, or, you know, um, you know, last session when we did this, we were talking about like these super athletes who are wearing like sports guards 24 seven, like they really are super athletes and they can't wear elastics because they have a mouth guard. You can wear aligners with mouth guards. You can wear brackets with mouth guards, but if you can't wear your elastics and that's the driving force, it's a bit limiting. So you either have to really drive it home with them. You know, when you have that mouth guard art, even if you're doing seven hours a day of, you know, intense, intense, these are like Olympic athlete type of people. Um, you know, when, when you do have it out, I need you to be like a superstar, you know, maybe they can rise to the occasion. Maybe they will do it. They're probably the only person who could do it <laughs> to be honest. But you know, sometimes there's like a, a woman my age, who's like, yeah, that sounds great. And I hear you that you've had great success with that protocol. Um, <laughs> but I'm not your person. Yeah. Trust us. Listen, listen if we to tell you, yeah, yeah. Then we accept our overjet <laughs> yes. and, you know, we just have lined up teeth, but we have a big overjet and, you know, so to a certain point, trust them. Um, but you know, we do, we really do try to give the option, educate them. Yeah. yeah we yeah, educate yeah. them. Yeah. Give them options and try to educate them in the right direction. But if they are those, you know, really firm on, yeah, I'm not going to wear elastics, whether they're with aligners or whether they're with this special device, not doing it, then, you know, then we trust them. Then we have to figure out option B. Okay. Do you want some IPR? We're like, what do you want here? Yeah. And I think that also using discretion that if someone's got a 15 millimeter overjet and they have no mandible, then are you going to be able to grow them a mandible or are you just going to retract all their anterior teeth? And are you going to be able to do enough of it that you'll finish in a, in a proper occlusion, you, you have to kind of gauge that as well, I think. But I agree with Kelly. I had a patient in last week who's 16 and she wants braces more than anything in life because they're retro is what she said. Yeah. <laughs> and she pretty much said she won't wear her, um, aligners until the point that her mom gives her braces and her mom oh. sat right next to her while she said all this. And you could kind of tell that this child was the one who ran the household. And so my goal is to make sure that it's a positive experience for the patient, but also for our us. Mm -hmm. I don't want to deal with that. So yeah. I would much rather say, you know, this is not the situation where it's going to be profitable to proceed. And so let's go ahead and, and punt it out. Um, we even do brackets and wires still for patients who are non-compliant. Mm -hmm. But if someone says they're not even going to start with the aligners, then we'll refer them somewhere else because it's, it's the patient has the complete wrong attitude and they're not as someone that I want to treat in our office. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so we have gotten them bonded and on and things are good. Um, there was something, there was a missing piece here. I was just thinking there was something, um, 
What was it? Well, do you want I've me to talk it. about how kind of some of the protocols we have differ for mid treatment, and then we'll talk yes. about refinements? How you go to oh, uh, that that off. was what it was. Yes. How to keep it on? And yes, yeah, thank you. Cool. That's okay. what it was. So what I'll talk about first then is I'm going to discuss kind of a different protocol because we don't do it the exact same way. Um, what we do, why why we again treat so aesthetically in our office is we uh, recognized that a lot of patients with their carrier, what caused them to not want to go ahead with it was that they weren't going to be able to start fixing their chief complaint right away. So a lot of people will say, well, my front two teeth are overlapped or crooked or crowded. And then we might need to have a carrier on an adult for six months in order to distalize those teeth. But their chief complaint isn't that they don't like their overjet. Their chief complaint is I don't like the crowding on my front teeth. And where I learned this from, I need to give full credit to Christian Fournier, who's an orthodontist out of Montreal. And so what he taught is that you do the carrier to the first premolar, and then on the canine to the canine, you have an aligner. So you start aligning their front six teeth. And then once you um, have distalized the buccal segments and you have the front six teeth aligning, which works very, very well, then you can go ahead and get a full aligner. And mm -hmm. it will cover the, all of the teeth. Because traditionally, again, the, the, the thing we'll go over next is how, when do you take it off? And how do you make sure when you take it off that you don't end up having issues with teeth relapsing? Exactly. So um, we really like this protocol because it starts getting patients aesthetic results right off the bat, but they're also working on their anterior posterior with the carrier off of the four. Yeah, I think that's an important point because, you know, we're looking at the whole mouth. We see the scan, you know, we've got our dental hats on or whatever. Patients don't know class two or why you're doing things. All they see is that now you've created a gap. I've got vampire <laughs> teeth. Like what in the heck is going on here? Um, and they just wanted their front teeth fixed and they're okay with the rest. They're okay. Like do what you're going to do. Uh, you know, I get your super intelligent guy, do what you're going to do in the back, but I'm expecting stuff in the front. So I really do like that protocol. I mean, I like the uh, lingual attachments. I think that's super clever. Um, and you know, and patients like that. So I think you're giving them what they want, but you're also really providing them the best care You're, you really are trying to set their bite up for future success um, really good function and aesthetics so you know you don't want to compromise too much on um you know just giving them what they want i think too many yeah. of us do that yeah. um and just cheating it out like ipr out the crap of people's teeth just to tuck it back like why yeah. are we doing that? Like, we really need to slow down and think about the long-term effects of that. And do people really understand what they're asking you to do? Um, so I, I do love that. And I will say um, as well. So when, when you've achieved your, um, you know, class one or super class one, we usually call it, we overcorrect. So we don't just hit that mesial buckle groove in a perfect world. We're going a little bit beyond because there's a little bit of a bounce back factor. Um, but when you're scanning to now transition to full aligners, upper and lower. You want to keep that carrier on. Uh, you want to scan over it and just, you know, with your, um, your, your scanning wand, whatever scanner you use, just do a little rock and roll. So you're getting under and over that um, bar. So you get as much of the premolar anatomy as you can. Um, keep in mind, it's not going to be um, a super perfect fit on the canine or the molar because they're virtually removing that carrier. That's what your instructions to the tech is going to be. Please virtually remove the carriers. Now we're transitioning to upper full aligners, you know, continue to blah, 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 rotate and blah, 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 all those types of instructions. Um, but because they virtually removed it, sometimes there's a little tiny bit of slack in the aligner. And for that reason, I tend to um, add a, a big attachment on both the um, molar, the, the 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 1626, the first molars, um, and or the canine or the premolar, whichever one you've debonded the carrier from to make up for that little bit of slap because I know it's going to be there. So I have a nice like horizontal, you know, beveled attachment or whatever it is I need um, to, to continue on. Uh, and um, you're going to leave on your, your Kaplan hooks. So whether they're bonded to the sixes or the sevens, wherever you had your carrier positioned, wherever your um, hooks are, um, you're going to leave those on and you're still going to set yourself up for class two elastics with precision hooks or, or hooks. If you like buttons instead, that's fine. Um, but you do want to leave yourself set up 
in case it bounces back a little bit, you can keep that driving force um, back. So scan over the bar. Do not take the bar off. Let's take and a quick, quick pause just because you yes. said something I think that a lot of listeners will ask about. Talk to me about Kaplan hooks for a quick sec. Okay. So there's different... Um, so that would be your hooks on the lower arch. So if you're bonding um, a carrier from the three to the six, typically your Kaplan hook or your silver button that you're, you know, leaving a little window cut out on your lower first molar. Um, a Kaplan hook is a nice flat button. It, it has a little waffle to it too. So it bonds really, really well. And it has like a little um, wire loop. It looks like bunny ears. And we typically bond, um, we angle them back like 45 degrees or so back towards the, what do you call this? Like the ramus? The dis distal gingival. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Distal gingival. The, Let's do um, that. Yeah. The buckle shelf. <laughs> yes. So that way, when you think about it with your elastics pulling back, that bunny ear, it's really hooking on that elastic and it, it's not going to slip off as easily. So it's even better than just like a little circle button where your elastic can hook over. It's like a nice long bunny ear that it's hooking onto. So I love Kaplan hooks. Um, Yes, they they are silver, but they're way back there. Yeah. No one sees them and, and they don't come. Don't do weight on the bottom arch. Yeah, they don't they don't debond that easily. We are using strong elastics, but they do a pretty good job if mm -hmm. you know your isolation is good. Um, now, if you're using the shorties, um, uh, like Dr. Schultz, going from premolar to the six, then you may want to bond or you should bond to the seven, the, the second molar, because you want mm -hmm. that long stretch. It's all about the elastics, remember? So yeah. if you're going a little further back in the max, go a little bit further back in the mandible. You and want I know to essentially be about... going, yeah, you want to essentially be going the four teeth. So from the canine to the first molar or from the uh, first premolar to the second molar on the bottom. So exactly. same, same distance. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I think that's great. So we took a pause to talk about Kaplan hooks. Um, Henry Shine or Serum sells the sidekick button. Do you ever okay. use a sidekick button? Have you ever used it before? I, no, I've heard of it, but just because it was probably a little costlier, yeah, they were um, my orthodont has never bothered. When they first yeah. came out, I think they were $10 for a cap or for a sidekick. And yeah. to that point, we also don't use the sidekick. Mm -hmm. um, we just use a standard Kaplan hook that we buy with our other buttons. It, I yeah. think, costs like a dollar normally for like a normal silver button. So you yeah. could keep a couple sidekicks around in case you had a lot of debonding or breaking mm -hmm. of your Kaplan hooks because they are yeah. quite strong and are meant to have a good bond. But I don't think that the $10 justifies it. Um, mm -hmm. I would just use it as a backup if you notice that it was frequently breaking or coming off. Yeah. And I, um, uh, with the, again, not to be aesthetic at all, but, um, like the micro mold kit where you have like a, it's like a little, it's like, um, a PFI instrument. It's got little attachments on the front end of it. It's like a little silicone jelly mold and you put your trans bond, your cement glue in there. Um, you can get those in all different varieties. So you can have a button, uh, you can have a, uh, it looks like a bracket. So it's like you're hand making your own brackets. Those are really great for elastics too. And they are like super bonded to the T. So I don't do it because it's aesthetic i do it if kaplan hook one fell off i'll take that hit I'll, I'll pretend it's you know i'll say it's okay maybe it was bad bonding um if i do it a second time and it comes off then i'm like wait a second there's something going on here um so usually i'll do a different option and it, oftentimes it's micro mold because it, it's cheap um i have the i have the cement already i have the kit the kit costs me nothing once you own it you own it and this um, is so called the that... just for everybody listening again this is the micro mold kit mm -hmm. do you know who yeah. sells the micro mold kit you can get them almost anywhere. Everyone kind of makes their own. Um, Ortho Supply of Canada definitely um, has one. There's a beginner kit where you have just like four or five varieties of like jello molds for different, you know, types of yeah. things that you can bond to the teeth. And then there's one that has like eight or nine, like, you know, turbo, yeah. like all these different ortho things that we use. Um, but really, really anything. I love them for aesthetic um, buttons too, where we actually are using buttons in the front. We're trying to hide them so that people look invisible. It's great for that as well. They don't debond as much because it's cement bonded to the teeth. Yeah. So, and, and you're, um, inspiring me to use mine. I've, I've had one for seven years <laughs> and or so <laughs> sitting in our office with a thousand other different ortho things I've bought that I haven't used in a long time. But what you mentioned when we first recorded was you, you use cement, you fill it with cement, not with composite. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. The same trans bond I would put on the back of the carrier 
or on the back of my Kaplan hook to to bond to the teeth on, on, on the back of any silver bracket or white bracket that I bond. It's the exact same glue. So it's, you know, it's not expensive. Um, it's ready. It's, it's already there. I already own it. So just this little kit that's, I think it's like $90. Yeah. They're not um, expensive. And the no. silicone pieces are reusable. You just sterilize yes. them. It yep. goes on like a little handle of an instrument. And yeah. then you just hold it against the tooth. You cure it. You take the silicone little jello mold, so to speak, off. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a very cool option for aesthetic attachments. We used to, one of the reasons I stopped using it is because we were using composite. And then the cost of the composite is a lot um, more expensive than the cost of what a white button would be. So True. that's why I kind of moved away from it. But with this cement option, that's where I'm very interested to, to change mm -hmm. the protocols. But yeah yeah and then the other thing we do if you're bonding to the lower first molars because you've got like a canine um to first molar carrier hooked up so you've got your first molars bonded with your kaplan hooks and all is going well um just to prevent emergency situations we usually will um ask our technicians to give us an extra precision cut um angled forward on those lower second molars and it's just a backup we, we may never use it mm -hmm. if everything goes well, but if one of those silver Kaplan hooks hops up, pops off and they're not due for another, you know, week, two, whatever, whatever, um, I don't want them to stop using elastics. I don't want them to drift back in the wrong direction. So at least they have this little flap of plastic that they can hook an elastic to, even if they have to back up on the strength of elastic, but, you know, usually they're okay. Um, but it just buys you some time. It buys you some time to find that emergency slot where you can rebond the Kaplan hook, or if they can't come in, you can accommodate them, but they're from mm -hmm. far away. At least they can keep the momentum going. Um, so that's a good strategy carrier or not. Sometimes yeah. we just build in these extra slits. Patients don't yeah. feel them. They don't see them. Interesting to that point. This is where the creativity and the planning comes in for appointments. For example, when um, my wife Amy and I were dating, I was doing her Invisalign case, which is allowed in Alberta <laughs> to treat your partner. <laughs> I'm just throwing that out there. And so she was doing her medical residency and she was two hours away from me. And I didn't want her to have any issues with her elastics. So I ended up bonding on a button to her lower sixes and sevens yes. because we really needed these elastics. She was a TMD patient. And so we needed some very heavy elastics. We weren't actually using a carrier in this situation. It was kind of a different case, but we put a button on the six and the seven because I knew that I had one backup tooth in case it fell off. Then she'd go from the seven instead. Now she'd come to the six exactly so, yeah. yeah yeah you learn these things over time and you know we're always trying to protect it's 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 also convenient for the patient yes. um you know it's like you've already thought out these problems you learn as you go um you yeah. just don't want yeah. people to constantly come back sometimes they only make it to the parking lot and you're like Shoot. yeah <laughs> yeah they're back <laughs> that's usually on us yeah. That <laughs> yeah if that one happens then um something happened with bonding <laughs> Yeah, uh, exactly. So, so you were um, at the point um, where we were, sorry to cut you off. We were just at the point then of talking about the um, going into refinements. So yes. um, Kelly had just mentioned to make sure that you put a button on or uh, an attachment nice and thick onto your canines or first premolars and the sixes because mm -hmm. the virtual removing of the carrier is not always super accurate. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to touch on something there, which is, Kelly and I both have probably made every mistake in the book when mm -hmm. it comes to these situations or learned from people who've made every mistake. And so what used to happen is you would take off the carrier and you'd have to make them an Essex to hold the space between their canine and their lateral or their uh, canine and their first premolar. But then if patients lost their Essex then, or weren't wearing them, then everything would shift forward back into that space. Mm -hmm. And so Kelly mentioned then in the refinement, you want to go ahead and have them wearing elastic still potentially. And what we have found is sometimes the patients will start to slip forward again and you need to have the elastics on full time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you wear the elastics at nighttime, but what you're kind of doing is you're just trying to help guide them into that proper class one occlusion. We do that um, super class one correction with the carrier. So then you have some um, anchorage lofts and some drifting mm -hmm. that can occur and that won't kind of screw everything up. But I've done it before where I used to take off the carrier, did not have any elastics for the patient to wear in their refinement. And now the patient drifted back into a class two. 
Mm-hmm. And so um, then we went and we had to get new trays for them and we either needed to put a carrier on again or sequentially distalize every tooth in the mouth. And so then we spent right. another eight months sequentially distalizing every tooth. So a key, key, key thing that Kelly mentioned was make sure if you're taking off your carrier, when you're closing up that space, make sure you put a button back on the tooth, leave your Kaplan hook because you don't need to take that off, but leave a button on or put a new button, sorry, onto your canine or your first premolar if you're, when you take off your carrier. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because yeah, sometimes you just need that little bit extra that it bounces back just a little bit. You've, you've corrected it. Things are going, or sometimes the patient's done as much as they can. You can sense they're burning out, um, whatever their age is. It doesn't matter. You can sense they're burning out and you're like, okay, you got me three quarters of the way. I got it from here and we're going to, you know, scan over the carrier and we're now we'll just sequentially distalize you or distalize that last little bit. Like we've got you. Sometimes you have to play that game because it's been eight months or something. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So you're helping them out. So you just don't want to lose what, what you've gained is, is the moral of the story here. And so, yeah, definitely in that next round, still keep the elastic set up in case you need it. There's no sense taking everything off only to then order a second refinement. And now you're hooking yourself back up. The patients don't like that either. To that, a good thing to mention to the patients at the consult then is that you're going to be using the bar to start with, but you still will have elastics later in your treatment to make sure that things don't drift forward. Mm -hmm. One thing we do a little bit differently again is um and we have some wild protocols like Mm -hmm. we do carriers different than i think anybody except for christian fournier in the world but then even some of the protocols we've changed since then are very different and Mm -hmm. i really want to put out a course in terms of how we kind of do things at our office in the near future on this i know there's lots of demand for it but we actually now don't remove the carrier once we've created that space So what we do a little bit differently is we'll distalize the teeth, hopefully into that kind of super class one from the first premolar. Then we'll go ahead with the aligner on the front six teeth. Then we'll go ahead and we tell the technicians when we scan to virtually raise the gingiva on the four, the five, and the six. So the first premolar, second premolar, first molar. And so what they'll do is they'll actually then, when they're marking where the gums are, They'll virtually raise them, meaning that when you actually see the clincher coming back, you'll have pink gingiva all the way up the buccal surface of the teeth. Almost what it's accomplishing is the same thing as like a button cutout, but it's removing the entire buckle of the teeth. So when the liners come, they're not going to interfere or hit the carrier. Right. We will then go ahead and have them put on an attachment onto the seven on the buckle, second molar. And then we'll have them put an attachment on the lingual of the first premolar. Okay. And we'll have attachments still usually kind of on the canine to canine region. That allows the aligner to snap over top of the teeth, covering the entire lingual surface and the entire clusal surface of all the teeth, the buccal surface of the second molar, the seven, the buccal surfaces of all the anterior teeth from canine to canine. And we'll actually close that space with the carrier on still. And the reason we do this is that we don't want to have any slippage of that anchorage loss where they kind of slip back into a class two, Mm -hmm. but we were kind of brainstorming, well, how can we be more efficient? We're taking off the carrier and then we're just going ahead and putting on a button instead. Could we not just go ahead and leave the entire carrier on? And then Mm -hmm. we only take it off when we're completely done and we don't need any class two correction at all. And the space is entirely closed. Right. And, and yeah, again, I think is... that's I think that's genius because yeah. also you're you've got the added layer of it's clear. So they're not in a hurry. I mean, it it, it looks yeah, pretty elegant care. to begin with. Even when it's silver, it looks pretty good, but clear is clear. So they're already right. happy. They're already used to the feeling of it. So you're you're really not going it, it's no big deal. They're so used to it. Um yeah. and, and it's more efficient. You haven't lost yeah. any any like not even a fraction of a millimeter yeah. which is awesome yeah exactly so what we found too then is we can be a little bit more aggressive and jumping to the refinement a bit sooner we don't need to have as much of that super class one correction either we can be yes. kind of locked in more of like a class one occlusion keep them wearing their force to heavy elastics while we distalize that anterior segment into the spaces okay awesome awesome um all right anything we haven't covered here Oh, we've gone through quite a bit. 
So <laughs> don't be afraid of adding another tool to oh, your toolbox. I've, I've got I've got something I'd like to yes. quickly jump on. Situations where the carry doesn't work. Okay. We like to say in orthodontics, or I'm sure all companies would like to make it seem like that things work every single time. There's definitely situations that I've had patients where we don't see distalization occurring. And I do think the patients are compliant. Mm -hmm. Is this frequent? No, it's not. Maybe looking at 5% or less of the cases. But I think it's important to, to bring up because sometimes we look at things and it's like, well, why isn't this working for me? And mm -hmm. this should work every single time. And that's just not reflecting reality. The reason why I think carriers do, don't always work in some cases has to do with how the teeth distalize and, and how the distal crown tip is occurring. If the patient has um, cortical plate in the posterior area, so the teeth are trying to distalize and the crowns or the roots as they're moving back are hitting the cortical plate. And I shouldn't say the crown, I should say more the... Um, the more cervical aspect of the root, if it's okay. starting to hit cortical plate, that's going to stop the tooth from distalizing or it will stop that distal crown tip from occurring Right. to actually create those spaces. And so I have one right now where I have a, a guy who has super, super mobile first premolars. He's wearing his carry very well. Right. Um, he's very committed to his treatment. I know that. We track him on dental monitoring so I can see how well he's wearing his trays every week. So he sends right. a scan every week, but his teeth aren't distalizing. And when we right. take a CBCT, we can see that he is starting to have, um, he doesn't have enough space for those teeth to distalize into. Mm -hmm. And because he has such a strong, strong bite where he's hypodivergent and he just keeps smashing those teeth back down into the original occlusal plane, that's the reason why we're not seeing success with this case. Right. So does that mean that we shouldn't use the carrier in any circumstance? Well, no, we're then throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. But I think that sometimes as speakers, or if you hear someone speaking from a company who's paid to speak, you don't hear about the failures of the appliance and that it right. doesn't always work. And so right. that is the truth of it. It doesn't always work. Just like mm -hmm. sequential distalization doesn't always work. Just like mm -hmm. a lot of other class two correction techniques don't always work. Um, yeah. So don't, don't um, get too upset if that happens, it's just something to be aware of and then address it with your patient that the bone yeah. density that you have isn't allowing these teeth to back up. Here are our options. We leave things yeah. still in a class two situation. We continue trying for longer if you have that in you. Mm -hmm. Or I guess theoretically, I'm not a big fan of this option for airway issues. But mm -hmm. if you want to fix your overjet, do we need to look to do something like extractions, mm -hmm. which is definitely not preferred? Uh, taking up out two upper premolars or something like a jaw surgery to get the jaw forward. But just don't right. think that you're the only person in the world that this appliance doesn't work for because sometimes oh. that's me too. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, we, we've done it. Obviously we tend to do a lot of things on our team members and not as an experiment. I mean, <laughs> like literally in the last couple of years, um, you know, we've done it on all our team members. It's a great appliance. That's our go-to appliance. And so, but some of those team members, um, they were stalling out. Like, why am I still in this carrier? And it's been 10 months and, and whatnot. Um, now, sometimes we do the shorty because we're trying to keep it aesthetic off their canines because they're they're women. Um, but we make the mistake of then only putting the Kaplan hook to the six, yes. too short of yes, a yes, span, yes. right? You got to back it up. You still need that big stretch. So again, you live and learn. You're like, oh shoot, let's not do that mistake on the next team member or the next patient. <laughs> um, but, but even when you have these super compliant patients, they're even doubling up their elastics. They're going overkill, things that we don't even tell our patients to do. We're like, just do it, just do it. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes they just don't go anywhere. And so then you're like, okay, let's readjust. What else can we do? What other tools, what other tricks do we have? Or do we need to compromise a little bit? You're not going to get to that over jet of 2.5. You're going to have over jet of 3.5. Can you live with it? Is that good? You know, you know, yeah. do, you we need readjust. In, do you need to add in some IPR to kind of cheat yeah. your way to the finish line? Do you exactly yeah, use, use the tools in your toolkit? I think that's why getting like a proper orthodontic kind of education allows yes. you to know what options you have. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, hopefully we've 
opened your mind to trying a few new things. You're not afraid of now using elastics and now something a little bit different um, in your, in your cupboard um, that you can, you know, mention to, to patients who are coming in new patient exam. And uh, you know, it just, it, the more you, the more, you know, the more you learn, the more tools that you have, the more freedom you have um, to be successful, really. Absolutely. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks for another fun and uh, enjoyable podcast, Kelly. Thank you. Awesome. We'll see you soon. We'll see you in the next month.